Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew. Tonight, I want to welcome back to the show, author and researcher of ancient history and philosophy, our friend Matt LaCroix. Matt always has fascinating information to share. Today, I know he's put together another fascinating presentation, one of my favorite topics, ancient history, mankind's hidden origins, our lost history, things they don't teach you in school. Matt, how are you doing today, my friend? Hey, it's great to be here. We always have some wonderful conversations. Um, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. So I'm awesome. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm very busy. I haven't done, obviously, as many shows as I used to do because I've been really hammering finishing this book, the new book, The Stage of Time, that I'm, I'm, I'm working hard to release for either next month or July, but it's coming fast. But at the same time, as much as I just want to throw it out there and give it to everybody because I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to release it, I want to make sure it's, it's, it's just right and, and it's not um, it's not going to have anything I need to fix or, you know, go back in and redo. I want to make sure it's perfect. Definitely. And we are so looking forward to that. Um, you've been on a few times. It's been a little while since you've been on. Just give us a, a brief bit about your background and what got you started on your research. Sure. So a little over 10 years ago, um, I was spending time looking into just generic, generic history things, things that everyone you know, learns about in school. And I came across some conflicting information along the way that started to make me rethink things. You know, there are, there's always some spark, something that makes you start to question the world around you and the nature of reality. And for me, that spark was some of the anomalies with ancient civilizations, as well as when I would... Um, when I would try to understand consciousness and understand, well, am I defined by my physical body or am I defined as conscious eternal energy? And at the same time, I was someone that was spending a lot of time in nature. And so I was, I was hiking around and seeing this, this intelligent design through all of nature, through the spirals and you know, this Fibonacci sequence, this golden ratio. So all of those different things were coming together and I was seriously questioning what I had been taught. And what we're taught is, what we're taught is that we're we're just this primitive ape that is in this world based on just survival of the fittest. That's how we got here, right? We we fought our way to the top, and now here we are with this big brain, and and our brain locally creates consciousness. And that when you die, that's it. You got your your shot. So do as take as much as you can with you because you're not coming back. And so all those things really really upset me because it gave me very little to live for. And so when I was out, I'd be out hiking and seeing these incredible places and pondering consciousness and what th things like love and how, you know, those are non-physical things that we can't measure. And yet people are so confident that they, that they understand what makes us who we are. But there's all these things about us that really separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom in terms of this sentience and a lot of the different ways that we perceive reality. And so all those things came together and it started to make me really question the nature of reality and, and history. And, and that's where the journey began for me because I started to, um, I read a book by Robert Temple called The Serious Mystery, which talks about how the Dogen people of Mali, Africa had all this knowledge about the serious um, star constellation and how or the Sirius system in the Canis Major star constellation in which they had information that some modern astronomers had not even discovered even today like the um, existence of Sirius C which is one of the stars that, that are found in that in that system and so th those were absolutely fascinating aspects for me to consider because it made no sense with this whole idea of well you just have nomadic people wandering around and they're discovering things as they go and then boom here we are but these these anomalies just didn't make any sense and they didn't follow along with what we're taught and so it's interesting that you have to have those events occur for for you to go look into things because if you don't it's very difficult to even want to question the paradigm because it's uncomfortable you're it's an uncomfortable experience when you say to yourself well, I think that there's things that we're not being told. And then that mindset is like, 
well, then that means we're being lied to. And that is a very difficult area to accept. And most people won't do it. They would, most people will just reject information that's uncomfortable because it doesn't feel good. And they just go along with whatever feels good like everybody else. But I, I had all these little anomalies and these little catalysts that came along that helped push me to the other side. And like we're about to go over tonight, Chris, when you see some of this evidence that you're not privy to and you don't have access to because it's very much suppressed and forbidden knowledge, you start to see that there's this entire aspect of not only ancient history, but the entire aspect of how we consider the nature of reality in the universe around us that we're not being told. And those are the things that we're going to be talking about today, specifically revolving around what happened in our ancient past, because that has huge implications for understanding our origins and how we got to where we are today. And so that's where we're going to go. And that's how I got down this road. And so 10 years later, you know, I acquired a lot of knowledge and I would be walking around in my backyard and on and during hikes and I would be pondering all this stuff. And I would have enormous amounts of information that I would say, ah, this connects and this connects and all this stuff would be sitting there. And before long, I had this very powerful nagging, this feeling inside that said, you need to do something with it. You can't, what are you going to just let it sit there and try to spout it off to most people that aren't even paying attention and you know, don't, don't even give you two, two seconds um, to, to talk because they think you're crazy or some, some conspiracy theorist or whatever, whatever um, terms they want to lump for people like us. But so, so I then started writing some of this down in more in terms of, you know, sharing things online and, you know, little, little blurbs and here and there. And that's when I started to progress further and further and decided to really start writing this down and doing shows and talking about it because I had a, like you do, Chris, and then we were talking about this before we came on a few minutes ago. We have a lot of passion when it comes to this area. This isn't like, oh, let's just do this because it might get some hits on YouTube or some people might read some of our work. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that this information is so fundamentally important towards altering how we perceive reality, our consciousness, and, and, and ancient history, that if, if we don't do this, who else is going to do it? I mean, there are, there are other researchers that are doing this, but you can't go in that mindset of saying, well, I don't really need to do this because someone else will do it. You don't know what you're going to be able to contribute. Your unique side of what you're going to bring to this, it means that if you're saying that, like, oh, someone else is going to do it. You might be missing out on a very important opportunity to give, to show your own self-expression of, of what you can contribute towards what I call this big, this collective ship of consciousness that we're all riding on, on this sea of, of an unknown future. So, so yeah, I'm, I make a long story short, Chris, <laughs> that was a long little intro on how I got into this, but I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this because it's, it's, an, it's the most passionate area that I, I, I have to research. I, I love this stuff. Very well said. And I agree with you so much. Um, you know, for me, I need to know what our past is. I mean, the, the mystery of that, it just drives me to seek more information. And I, I thought a good place for us to start is, you know, we've been through cyclical cataclysms every however many thousands of years they occur and wiped us out to where we don't know what happened before that. So we could go back millions of years as, as you know, uh, as advanced humans. So, you know, based on some of your research, how far back do you think we actually go? Okay. And so as much as I can agree that it's, po it's definitely possible that we go back a lot further than even what I'm about to, to come up with now, which is just, it's purely based on the oldest and the oldest dates that we have for how far back sophisticated um, human civilizations go. But that does not mean that, that there, there weren't other lost periods that might have occurred and maybe they were wiped out and so much time went by that there was absolutely nothing left from it at all and then there's no records to even show that they were there. And so we... The, the one number one thing you want to do as a researcher, researcher is never stay close minded towards um, at least accepting or not accepting, but at least 
discussing and thinking about alternate theories. It, it, that's the um, one of the telltale marks of a more advanced mind is someone that even if they think they know exactly what happened, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't allow other ideas in and then weigh them and consider them. You can't immediately reject something. And so what we're going to go over today is just based on what the evidence we have left over is. Because like you said, we've had these cataclysms on our planet that were so severe, and I, and I can go over what some of those were at some point, but they were so severe that they completely wiped out an entire lost civilization or civilizations, you could even say, because there was multiple ones. But in general, a lot of researchers today are lumping them into two different categories either the pre-Diluvian civilizations or the post-Diluvian civilizations, which are separated by these great cataclysms and floods. And that's what we're going to talk about today, are some of these pre-Diluvian civilizations. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, So because we're going to go through some pictures um, while we talk about this in some slides, because it really helps when, oh, well, someone's reading some ancient writing somewhere. I don't know what that is, but then you have a picture right in front of you saying, oh, wow, that's, that's what it looks like and that's what he's reading from. And, th and that's what I want to bring to the table. I want to bring to the table something that's completely evidence-driven to understand what really happened, okay? Awesome. Very excited. Let's begin. Okay. How are we looking, Chris? I got you. We have the ancient city of Kitch. Excellent, excellent. Okay, now, so Kish, which is what we're, we're about to get into, this is what's known as a post-Diluvian city, but it's still very important because it's the first post-Diluvian city. And as we're reading, this will start to make a lot of sense. So there's two pieces of key evidence, and there are, there are others too, but there's two really um, important ones that, that stand out that really talk about how far back human history goes. Not necessarily this Denisovian Neanderthal human history, because that's like, a, like an early, early ancestor of human history that we're gonna get into, how that plays into human origins. But what I'm talking about is when mankind became, had these, these civilizations of, begin, you know, cities and laws and all those things. And that's where this all comes down to. So in, in the Iraq, Syria area, where all the war is today, has some of the most important ancient texts that were, have ever been written by mankind. In fact, a lot of the stories that are contained within them, such as the Atrahasis, which became the story of Noah later in the Bible, those, those stories, many of those were taken from these cuneiform tablets. Cuneiform, for anyone who doesn't know, is an ingenious method of writing where you can inscribe inside a clay tablet or sometimes stone you can inscribe within that tablet so that and then you can bake it and, and, and turn it into a very hard substance that's, that's hard to erode but the purpose behind that is if you write inside of something rather than on the outside of it like on a, a cave wall or on a piece of paper you're able to retain that information far longer than you ever would by any other conventional means and i mean a lot longer. In some cases, these these tablets are thousands of years old. Look, likely over ten thousand years old in some of these cases, and that's but that's the beauty behind how sophisticated and advanced they were. They made these so that they would last thousands and thousands of years, and so, so that one day that the story the stories from long ago could be understood and heard. If you were a, a person that lived more than 10,000 years ago. And let's say you were part of, you were part of a royal family and you, had, you were privy, because this is important to understand, we're gonna get into this. Not everybody was privy to information back then. And, but you were privy to some of this higher knowledge and some of this information about what occurred even long before you were alive with important things like the creation, even the creation of Earth but all the way up to the creation of mankind, the first cities, what their names were, who ruled them, how long did they rule them for. If you were privy to that information and you knew all that, you would be very adamant to make sure that survived because you would be smart enough to think, well, if this doesn't survive, then how is anyone, anyone gonna know anything? How are they gonna understand what occurred at this time period? 
especially if you had cataclysms occurring at the time. And, and that's one of the misconceptions that people think of is, oh, a cataclysm happened, you know, a day, two, a week, and then it destroyed everything. How about a series of cataclysms that maybe occur over hundreds of years? Okay, so we're not talking about something that just was a quick, quick thing that happened and boom, everything's gone. Some of these civilizations knew that these cataclysms were wiping things out. The, the glaciers were all melting. They knew that terrible things were occurring. And that's why, number one, we find ancient cave systems all around the world, especially in places like Garankuyu, Turkey, which is right in the heart of this Mesopotamian area where some of the oldest civilizations were. They knew that they had to su survive some of these cataclysms, which was also based on intense solar activity too. So intense it could melt rock. The only way to survive things like those kinds of radiation levels and the dangers that were occurring would be to go underground. That'd be the only feasible way to survive, and that's exactly what they did. That's why when you see like cities like Garankuyu could house well over 20,000 people with sophisticated air shafts and means of housing animals and, and people in, in different groups and living quarters and all these different sophisticated means, because they knew that these cycles occur. And we're going to go over why these cycles occur and, and how often they, they occur too. And so they created these cities to survive it. At, at the same time, they had to create these, these writings that they knew would survive too. And if you look at a place, one of these ancient sites, I want to bring up really quick before we get into this, one of these ancient sites called Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is right next to Anatolia, this area that goes near uh, Derinkuyu, this is the same general region. Um, archaeologists have proven with very concrete evidence to show that those, that site was, not, was as, almost as much time as it was to create it, they spent burying it. Think about what that means for a moment. They spent so long burying this because they knew they had to or it would be completely destroyed and wiped out because the, the information they had on some of these giant T-shaped megalithic pillars describing these cataclysms and a lot of the celestial understanding that they had based on this processional um, zodiac age information and the equinoxes, all the information they had, they knew they had to preserve. So they buried it before these cataclysms came rolling through and then... Here we go, thousands and thousands of years later, archaeologists dig down and they find these, these sites, right? And so why did they do that? Well, these kings knew that disaster was coming. So what we have is, when you're looking at what they discovered in some of these ruins in some of these ancient libraries, you have two key pieces of evidence that describe how far back human history goes. The first one is called the Sumerian King List. And the second, which is much less well known, is called the Eridu Genesis, okay? And so I'm going to be reading, as we talk about this, some, some direct quotes from these tablets. Now, of course, just like you always want to do as a good researcher, make sure you have the best translations that you can. I highly recommend a seriologist's um, translations from uh, Stephanie Daly and George Smith, which are, just came from two completely different time periods, but, but are experts. Be careful with, with anything that is fully mainstream something like the University of California or some of these other places, I've come across situations where I, I've read tablets that coincide with, with other information within them. And then you go over somewhere else and they've been translated completely differently in this like very simplistic fashion where it leaves out all this information. So just, just be careful, be, always be objective and open-minded. And remember that there are those that, those out there, there are certain secret societies and powerful people who don't want some of this information getting out. That's why you don't learn about it in school. That's why this is not part of our curriculum that we're taught, because it questions and contradicts the entire narrative for human history. So the Eridu Genesis was a single cuneiform tablet that was recovered in the city of Nippur, okay, in Iraq. Now, Nippur is one of these ancient cities that is mentioned in these lists. That's, and that's how you know it's genuine. And it was only one fragment that remained, okay? And it was, it was, it was a broken fragment with just these, this small amount of text that was left. And that's another point we got to remember about this, is that all we have left are whatever survived. As good as, the, as, as advanced as they were about creating these, to survive long, long, long periods of time, they still couldn't... Um, 
guarantee that someone wouldn't destroy them with other means, with all these armies coming through and conquering and stealing them and breaking them, or whatever else came along. So what we're dealing with today are whatever we have left. Either whatever we were given, and archaeologists were able to record, or whatever wasn't stored away in places like the Vatican Archives so that people could never see it ever again. So the era to Genesis, this piece, this little tablet, it discusses when kingship was first lowered to these cities, not nomadic tribes coming together with teepees and then, and then making mud huts and then eventually slowly things come around and commerce develops and laws. That's what we've been told is how human civilizations developed, but that's not what these tablets tell at all. In fact, in, in fact, in sites like Gobekli Tepe that I just mentioned, the evidence there shows that they were hunters and hunter and gatherers there originally, but then all of a sudden agriculture comes out of nowhere and they get, they get completely advanced and they start building all these sites. That is direct evidence for influences from what I now, a, a term I like to call these wisdom bringers who, who came from several different places and we're going to go over where those places were. Um, not, sometimes they're not really where you would expect, but so these wisdom bringers created these civilizations and they, they taught the people that were there and they sophisticated the people and, and helped them create these civilizations. And that's where all this came from, okay? So what the Eridu Genesis says, and it starts by saying, when the royal scepter was coming down from heaven, remember that term heaven, okay? The August crown and the royal throne being already down from heaven, the king regularly performed to perfection the August divine services and offices and laid the bricks of those cities in pure spots. The firstling of the cities, Eridu, she gave to the leader, Nudimid. The second, Bad Tibira, she gave to the prince and sacred one. The third, Larak, she gave to Palisag. The fourth, Sipar, she gave to the gallant Utu. The fifth, Sharupak, she gave to Ansid. So those cities come up in other tablets later on. When you read the Sumerian King List and you read the Atrahasis, you find out that Sharupak was one of these, these ancient cities that Atrahasis, Noah, he, that he ruled in later right before the cataclysms came through. So we have all these stories from these ancient tablets that talk about what occurred before these disasters happened. Because what you find is that there was this entire lost civilization across the planet. And I mean, all around the planet from the Americas down through um, Easter Island, all the way across to Mesopotamia, Egypt, right up through um, along the Mediterranean and in places in Southeast Asia and, and all the way over to Japan. You can still go over to, to, to Japan, to the Imperial Palace. And there's, there's sections where you can find these massive megalithic walls. And that is the very important key phrase I want everyone to remember. If you ever see megalithic, sophisticated building without mortar, with this perfect design, it is always from these lost civilizations. That's, and that's a key point to remember because when you travel around the world to places like Machu Picchu, you see all of this more primitive building right on top. And at the lowest levels, there's these remnants of these incredibly sophisticated megalithic building. And, and what does that tell you? It tells you that there was at least two very distinct time periods in human history. One where human civilizations had tremendous knowledge and sophistication, which, and they were then largely destroyed and they, and then they try to restart civilizations again. And, but, but over time that was largely lost and it, and it wasn't able to be accomplished. And that's what these, these specifically say. So, and I want to, before you jump in, Chris, I just want to um, bring up um, the Sumerian king list as well, because the way we need to confirm information is if it's carried over in multiple different places. If you read something that gives names of different cities and information, and then you read it in a completely different tablet that was found in another location, that gives you some credible evidence to take, take what it says very seriously. So when I mention cities like Eridu, Bad Tibera, Larak, um, Sipar, and Sarupak in, in the Eridu Genesis reading I just gave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Sumerian King list and then see what it says in it, okay? Because that really blows your mind when you start to consider this. 
So what the Sumerian king list says is it starts by saying, after, after the kingship descended from heaven, just like Eridu Genesis said, coming down from heaven, being given to them, right? After the kingship was descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Aluam, be, Aluam became the king. He ruled for 28,000 years. Then Eridu fell and kingship was taken to Bad Tabira. Okay, and then it goes on to mention that ki kingship fell and was then moved to Larak, then moved to Sippar, and then Sharupak. Exactly the same order in time frame that the Eridu Genesis gives. Okay, now what that means is if you add up all the different dates that are given for how long these different these different kings ruled in these cities, you get a total of two hundred forty one thousand years. Okay. So what that means is that if you add up 241,000 by the amount of time we've, that has gone by since then, you get somewhere around 250,000 years ago. And I know that that's something that most people might just go, what? That's impossible, right? That's, that's, in, that's completely impossible. We're told that in, in our school books that human civilizations arose about 4,500 years ago in Mesopotamia still, but only 4,500 years ago. So when you get some of these other tablets and some of this evidence that throws back the date of these megalithic civilizations to before the last ice age, we know that by ice core samples from Greenland, we can see when all these cataclysms occurred if, with, a, with very, very strict accuracy actually distinct accuracy, you, you see when that occurred, Zeus, okay, so these advanced lost civilizations were alive before 12,000 years ago, okay? And we're not going to give dates on how far back that goes yet, like, like I just said, but we know that that's what the geologic evidence states. It states that they're older than 12,000 years ago. But the, that, but the question then comes in, how far back did they go? How far back do they really go? And, and when did they first began, begin? And, and I think that that's one of the keys for why these civilizations were so advanced. We're talking about civilizations that were given knowledge and information, but they also had 200,000 years to perfect everything. By the time they were done, they had megalithic structures located on specific ley line locations, energy convergence zones across the planet, everywhere on, on almost every single energy convergent ley line they had built these megalithic temples and pyramids right in those locations and that's a very key point to remember it means that they they became so advanced and sophisticated that they literally created a global civilization to harness the energy of the planet for two reasons one and we're not going to jump too far ahead right now but it was for reaching these higher states of consciousness and tapping to this unlimited energy, this electromagnetic energy of the planet. Isn't that amazing, Chris? That is, that is fascinating. And another aspect of that is, it, like you said, it seems that all over the world, civilizations appeared to get some sort of upgrade. Um, all of a sudden, they start developing agriculture and languages, and it, it just seemed to have come out of nowhere but uh, it had to have come from some kind of source. It did, it, it did. And so when we, when we look at other tablets, like, like the legend of Atanya, he states very clearly that, that he was this divine ruler who was given, given um, this, th his destiny based on these, uh, these wisdom bringers from heaven who, who decided, decreed that he would be the ruler of the city of Kish. Now, so what is important about this? Well, Kish was the first city after all these disasters occurred where they were, where some of these advanced civilization wisdom bringers that were still ar around tried to recreate everything that, that was around before. Okay. And, that, and that's what I'm going to read you a, a very short little excerpt from the legend of Atanya where he states that, and it's very clear about that. So, Atanya was this first king of Kish who was designated to rule Kish. And you're looking at a picture of Kish right now, okay? And so, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this and we're going we're gonna to show this. So right in the middle of the screen is, um, is the Eridu is the Genesis, what it looks like, okay? And, 
and previously was showing you the Sumerian king list. Now, in the background is also the, the, the ancient city of Kish. Now, this is what uh, the legend of Atanya begins by saying, okay? Just like the Eridu Genesis and Sumerian king list, very similar. It says, they planned a city. The gods laid its foundations. They planned the city of Kish. The Ajiji founded its brickwork. And remember that term, Ajiji. Let him be their people's shepherd. Let Atanya be their architect. The great Anunnaki gods, or gainers of destinies, sat taking their counsel concerning the land. The creators of the four, four, four world regions, establish, establishers of all physical form. I, I, that's one of my favorite passages of any tablet of all because it contains so much important information. Not only does it talk about how Kish was the first city that was chosen to have kingship lowered down to, and for those who don't understand what kingship is, remember in Eridu Genesis, when I, when I read it says, when the royal scepter was coming down from heaven, there's this idea where these wisdom bringers that brought this information, they had this very distinct idea of how they want things to be run. They want this royal kingship structure where a certain bloodline king will rule over all the people based on a very specific set of laws and guidelines. Because if you have, let's say you have like a modern democracy like we have today that perhaps isn't corrupted by money and all the different, inform and all the different ways that they get coerced. Let's just say it was a pure democracy where the people could completely vote for whoever was in office. You would have no idea who was going to get voted in. And that was what they were concerned about. They had to make sure a certain ruler would rule ultimately over all the other ones. That's why kingship represents this, this pyramid structure of a king right at the top and then disseminating down everyone below him. But the king would have ultimate power over everything. And that's why it was created this way. Kingship, if you, and you remember I kept saying um, – Kingship fell and then it had to be relowered again to, to Larag and Shurupak, all these different cities, because they had to keep creating kingship and redesigning it over and over again because wars broke out or something would happen and, and it would all fall apart. Because these ordainers of destinies, and I love that term, they were um, obsessed with making sure that our reality went a certain way. That, that's the whole purpose behind it. They wanted a certain kind of governing structure in place for human civilizations because they knew that that would then um, uh, grow on top of its, itself until it became the structure of our reality, essentially, okay? And so, uh, so Atanya was, the, was this king that was chosen to rule over the people like their shepherd, and he was considered the architect, the designer, and he was given all of these laws, rules, how to, how to govern a civilization, and it's that information and what he says is, is um, mirrored almost exactly by the Code of Hammurabi, another cuneiform tablet that I highly encourage people to read in which, in which Hammurabi was this king of Babylon, okay? So all of these different tablets, and all of this information just keeps intertwining and connecting together. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about focusing so much of the new book, talking about this and talking about these lost civilizations and including their translations because it, it's, it's so mind boggling, boggling to consider and to read about because it completely re, re, rewrites how, what we consider to be human history. Okay. Um, and now if, for those who don't know, um, the word ordain means to order or decree. Okay. So there, it's interesting how he calls these Anunnaki gods in which has become a very polluted term, unfortunately, but it, the, I, read, I read you the direct translation. Um, the, the, they call them the great Anunnaki gods, the ordainers of destinies, meaning they literally choose who they want to rule and who, and they create the destinies of, of these people, right? Um, and I, and I want to just, and I want to say that when we look today at this, this structure to, to our world and how these certain few at the top have always had power and there's just been these kings that have ruled in these, in these dynasties for you know, thousands of years. You really can see where it came from, that it wasn't just this emergence of primitive humans. The archaeological evidence states quite, quite the contrary, wouldn't you say? Yes, definitely. I mean, it, it's so fascinating to, to think that 
all of this, you know, is, is not being taught to us that we could know so much more about ourselves if this was explored more. And it, it brings me to who are these gods? Are they spiritual entities? Are they extraterrestrial beings? You know, what exactly are we dealing with? Well, that's a great question. So, so who are they, right? Who are these wisdom bringers? Now, I think we can lump them into two different categories. One category, you could lump into, you could call them powerful pyramid priests and these, um, these incredibly knowledgeable wisdom bringers that came from these lost civilizations, okay? And some of them, like those who came from Atlantis and those who founded the Americas, some of them um, likely came, like I said, came from Atlantis when it was destroyed. So if you, you had this, and I think Atlantis was one of the, the first advanced civilizations that was created that became so large and dominant that it ended up branching off and connecting to a lot of these other civilizations around the world, perhaps as a focal point. Like we could maybe consider some of our central cities today, like Washington, D.C. or London or a number of these other ones. Um, so, I, so what you see when you read uh, Plato's description of Atlantis and, and what happened to it and how... Um, you know, when it was being destroyed, some of the wisdom ended up in Egypt and all these things. You can, you can trace these back to this, you could call it a migration path of wisdom that went through these different cultures, you know, into Africa, which was called Chem back then. And then over to, into places like in, in the Americas and along the Mediterranean and over into the Southeast Asia. And there's all these different influences. At the same time, though, who were these who were these, these original ordainers of destinies that created kingship long ago in these cities and created civilizations long before any people could achieve some higher state of knowledge? And that becomes a lot more complicated. And I want to start by <clears throat> giving an example about the nature of reality before I throw out who they are. <clears throat> right now, you and I are talking in observing what is considered the third dimension, okay? It's where matter becomes physical. And, and the important thing to understand is it is, it is one of the only, only dimensions where, ma where matter is physical. Once you go above the third dimension, the fourth, the fifth, on up into the ninth dimension, which is what these ancient texts state, it states that there's nine dimensions. When you, when you go beyond the third dimension, they're all non-physical. Try to wrap your head around that. Okay, so if, there's, if there are nine dimensions that make up the nature of reality, and human beings, because of our limited perception based on the visible light spectrum, okay, that's, that's the key to remember. What is that, the name of that? The visible light spectrum. It means that it is what we only perceive is the visible light spectrum, which is the third dimension, okay? So that means that our perceptions are extremely limited to reality. It's like we have blindfolds on to most of what's going on around us because it's invisible to, to us. We get little hints of other dimensions. If you get into deep states of meditation, okay, and you get into or you take some of these powerful psychoactive drugs, um, some of these plants and things like that, you can leave the third dimension. And you can enter in these other realms where you're all of a sudden outside the physical, physical reality. You're in a completely different place and it's, it, it feels different. And you start to say to yourself, wait a minute, is this my true identity? Is what I'm experiencing right now, is this what, is this what I am? I am, am I eternal consciousness that, you know, ex that resides in it on a multidimensional level, but maybe it's, trapped in this physical body in the third dimension because that's part of how we're supposed to learn and experience this reality that's what all the evidence points towards but what that really means is as human beings we have the capability to experience things that are beyond the third dimension like consciousness love and all these different complex emotions that go along with us that reside that are non-physical remember that means that they're not part of this dimension that they go beyond that 
And, and that's the whole point is we're able to, to only on a minor level perceive things that are outside the third dimension because the vast majority of our understanding and our perception is just of the third dimension. However, there are, like I just said, there are many, many other dimensions, both upper dimensions and lower dimensions, okay? Now, if, you, if we are eternal conscious energy, and that's what we really are, then that means that there has to be other beings that exist in the universe that also are sentient conscious beings, okay? Now, if you consider the fact that the Drake equation um, postulates that there are likely millions of other Earth-like worlds, potentially even billions that exist in the known universe. And of those, even if most of them succumb to self-annihilation or destruction or whatever of these dangerous things that come along, like we're talking about with this lost history, even if you account for all of those things, there still would be at least a handful, if not hundreds, of, of sentient civilizations that were able to reach a higher state. Now, think for a minute. What would happen if, if a being was able to go beyond the, the physical dimension? What if they were able to, able to conquer the physical dimension, okay, and become what's known as interdimensional? Um, if, if they were, because that really is the end game, right? What, the end game, think about what's the, the, the end game meaning this, the higher states that we can possibly reach. You know, the furthest that we can go is conscious energy. It's not in a physical body. It would always be non-physical. And that's the whole point of this is that somewhere and I can, I, and there, there are theories about perhaps Sirius and some other locations for where they came from, but that the evidence um, very, very strongly points and discusses in these cuneiform tablets that there were these, there were these beings from heaven that came down and they gave this wisdom and this knowledge, this, this kingship structure to create civilizations on earth and, and more importantly, and, and we're going to talk about the origins of mankind after, Chris, right? More importantly, they gave us the entire structure to our reality. Okay, it wasn't based on just some nomadic, slow process where we got here from. It was boom. All of a sudden, human civilizations become sophisticated out of nowhere. And that's what every single one of these records states. It came out of nowhere. Agriculture just came out of nowhere, mathematics. Think about what mathematics is. Mathematics is literally the language of the entire universe. The universe is this intelligent design from some intelligence, we'll call it, right? Some call it God, where, it, it, where everything is based on this mathematical golden ratio principle, where everything is perfectly designed so that it would be in balance, okay? Now, at the same time, at the same time, we, we like to consider this all coincidences that, you know, all these things that are happening to us here and everything, oh, it's just all just a coincidence or we got here based on, you know, whatever, just simple means. But really, it's a lot more complicated than that. And we, I don't think that we should really limit ourselves to how we, how we perceive beings in the universe. I think that because of the distances between locations, like for instance, if you want to try to travel to the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy to us, it's two and a half um, billion light years away or two and a half million light years away. Meaning that if you travel the speed of light, it would take you two and a half million years to reach there. Okay. And the speed of light is something that we can't even achieve now, which to me means that I think the way we have to wrap our heads around other sentient beings and extraterrestrials, if we want to call them, but that maybe potentially influenced us here is that it would always be uh, on a non-physical level, meaning that they, those beings had already conquered reality and that they're coming here through other completely other means like wormholes or stargates or these, these shortcuts through space where they can just, they can just go somewhere whenever they want to. And, and I think that, that a lot of others have realized that as well. And that's the direction that a lot of people have really started talking about because um, one of the things that the Atrahasis talks about in such great detail was that, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be reading about that. Um, actually, you know what? I'll just, I'll pull that up right now as we're talking about this because it fits in really well. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so basically the Atrahasis talks about how um, mankind came about, but it also, it also talks about the purpose behind, behind what, they were, what they were doing here. And the idea was that, 
there were these lower beings from them, from these, they call themselves the Anuna. Okay. There were these lower beings that called the Ajiji who are still advanced, but not as advanced as they were. And they were doing all the, the physical work on earth. They were here before, before humans had a more advanced understanding when we were Neanderthals and Denisovians and not to state that those were some stupid ape or anything. And they weren't, they were um, in many cases a lot stronger and more capable of surviving on the planet than we are, which is also evidence for to, um, to prove that evolution isn't what we, what we've been told based on the fact that we have actually, we're actually less developed and able to survive on the planet than we used to be able to be. So it's a, it's backwards because we weren't designed for a survival of fittest mentality. We were designed for reaching higher states of energy and consciousness. That was the whole pur purpose behind that. Okay. Um, so the Atrahasis basically states that, um, that, these Anuna were, were obsessed with conquering reality. They called it, they call it the chain, the chain that would set them free. And I think what that, what that specifically is talking about is how they were seeking a way to be eternal and to, and to break free from this cycle of dying and having to then reincarnate back into a being and then having to try to learn everything over again and start over again. They wanted to conquer that. They wanted to conquer it and completely get past it, and they did. And the way that they did that was, or one of the ways they did that was by creating mankind. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I'm, I'm going to pause on that because we're going to get back to that after. The whole point of it is, is that these beings, these wisdom bringers, they have the ability to take on physical form. That's important to remember. Of course, they can come down and take on physical form, but they were able to achieve that whenever they want. They were, they were able to become interdimensional beings that were non-physical and that's why they're talk, talked about how they came down from heaven and they brought all this wisdom and all this knowledge and as we start to talk about these megalithic structures and communicating with them you start to really put the pieces together about how all this works okay so we talked about reality the nature of reality and everything where we've been given such a dumbed down version of reality you know, primitive reality, work in this reality, the wars are going on everywhere, you're trying to survive, you're every, it's all a distraction. It's all this massive distraction from us understanding our higher consciousness and, and how to achieve these higher states of energy, okay? Because if people knew that, if people really understood what these ancients already knew, and they understood what happens when you go beyond the veil of consciousness and you reach these other states, they, it would completely change our reality. And that's what I wanna, I'm going to bring up right now. If, if somebody saw, it was, it, was a, it, was a great, it was a great podcast. Graham Hancock just did a recent podcast with Joe Rogan, okay, where he's talking about his new book. And he gives this little discussion on there that I think is really important. People, people should check out because it, it's a very interesting what he says in it because he's one of these proponents that wants to, he, he mentions that some of these beings may have been supernatural but he wants to think that they were advanced humans okay that's what he says however what he says in this in this in this comment is sort in, in his one this one comment that I'm about to read sort of contradicts that and it shows you that there there's this whole idea behind those who are knowledgeable of this information are aware that there are there are entities that exist in other dimensions very much aware of that, but it's so complicated and there's so much credibility in the line that they just don't talk about it. They just say, they just stick with human civil lost civilizations, megalithic structures and like energy and boom, that's it. So it's interesting what he says. He just, so Graham Hancock is discussing on the later show how when, when you, um, if you go down to like the Amazon and you take ayahuasca, right, which is based on DMT which is which are part of these psychoactive plants and the whole purpose behind these plants is interesting as they are and that's a whole other discussion for another day on how they came to be the way they are but the whole purpose of these plants whether or not you want to talk about peyote or psilocybin mushrooms or dmt or whatever there's a, there's many different kinds they all do the same thing they allow consciousness to be freed from the constraints of the body to be able to go through the veil to be able to reach these higher dimensions that's what they do Okay. And on the flip side, if you do things like 
really say sat- these satanic blood sacrifice rituals, you're able to, to, to go into the realm of lower dimensions and some of these other locations where there are, there are different kinds of beings. So essentially all of this is going on around us and it's completely invisible to us because we can only perceive the third dimensional world. So the whole thing becomes how can mankind be puppeteered by the shadows without us knowing about it until, oh, the game is up and we realize that we're in this, this you know, created game here, okay? And so what Graham Hancock says is he's talking about how if you, go, if you go down to some of these in the Amazon, you take ayahuasca, how these ancient shamans would go into these altered states of consciousness and they would basically become, come into contact with entities that reside there, okay? And this is a quote that he says. He states, I'm not making any claims on the reality status of those entities, but what I, what I am saying, and it's a fact, people who work with DMT and ayahuasca do encounter what they construed as being entities who communicate to them intelligently. Okay. Isn't that interesting? So he's, he's completely acknowledging Chris that those entities that exist in those other dimensions are real, but he doesn't want to make any claims on the status of them in our reality. Just let that sink in for a second. So they exist, but I don't want to talk about them (laughs) and I don't want to go into it. And that makes sense, right? I mean, if you start to do that, people think you're a woo woo and they, they disregard all the work you've done. And all of a sudden, you know, you have this foundation of sand because a lot of people aren't ready for that yet. But the fact is, even if you're not ready for it and you don't want to believe it, it's, it's, they're there. It's evidence all throughout history. And that is what we're about to, we're going to get into at some point. We talk about the purpose of these, of some of these megalithic structures was they were entirely created so that humans can reach such a high state of consciousness that they can get and communicate with these wisdom bringers. Because after all, that's where all the wisdom comes from. And I'm not trying to poo poo on, on human inventions and in, in how smart we are because we are really smart but the, the fact is when you look at where all the origins of mathematics and ast- astronomy and agriculture and laws and basically everything we have it all came from sumer with what they say was descending from heaven okay from these entities and beings because that's really the end game for any any sentient advanced being would be to become non-physical and so that's what we got to start rubbing our heads around. So when we have all this talk about angels and demons and fallen angels and the, um, the, the, the jinn mentioned in Abrahamic religions, all of these things, the Anuna, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. They're just beings that reside in higher and lower dimensions, mostly higher dimensions, okay? And that's the, what I really want to get across here when we wrap our heads around who these wizards wisdom bringers are and why these advanced civilizations would have such an inherent need to have to alter their consciousness in spending, you know, making these massive megalithic structures. And the truth is we have the great pyramid left and some of the other locations, but most of them were all destroyed. We have no idea how big and sophisticated some of these structures were because the cataclysms that came through were so destructive. They, they just, they destroyed most of them. Now, I guess that brings me to, um, were, did these beings actually create us or did they somewhere along the way genetically modify or help us out in some way like that? And also, is there a prime creator, a divine source of everything? Maybe we can get into that. Sure. Let me start with, with the end first and then go backwards. So like I was saying, when you look at the universe and you look at the laws that go into it, if um, mathemati- um, mathematicians and astronomers have, have looked at, well, you have all these galaxies you know, flying around and all these planets rotating around different stars and everything is, is based on this perfect formula. When I mean perfect, I mean so precise that if, remember, everything's based on math. That's the language of the entire universe. That's how it was designed. It's just a mathematical formula. So, it, so the, the point is, if it was all random, if there was just this big bang and everything was just thrown out right into, into everywhere, but it was based on nothing. Like it was just based on like some kind of a, 
and that doesn't even really answer it, right? Because if you think of it that way, but if it was just based on it all being created randomly from nothing, it, it, would, it would all fall apart. It would all collapse. That's, that's what they've determined, that it's so precise, the way everything's been designed, that it has to be from some kind of an intelligent creator. And I, and I really do think that that is what a lot have termed God. And I, I don't really like that term because I think the term is very polluted. So I, I use something like um, prime creator or, you know, like the great architect or source or whatever you want to call it. But the point is, if you have that, right, the creator of everything, and then if, if you have beings that reach such an advanced state, what's the end game? Well, they would try to, to play like they're the creator. That's it. That's what they would try to do. They would try to be like they're the creator because that would be the, that'd be the ultimate. There would be no higher purpose. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what these beings did. If you read these tablets, it states that they came here long ago, before what we're about to go into with mankind's origins. But they came here long ago, and they took over this realm. Because really, what is Earth? It's this very special planet that has a certain kind of electromagnetic energy. And I don't think every planet's the same. I do think that Earth is unique, and I think that's one of the reasons why they came here, because it's all about energy. Remember how I said, Chris, that they wanted to conquer reality? That's yeah. how they did it. They used Earth to conquer the incarnation cycle to become eternal. They're eternal beings that are, some, some claim, maybe millions of years old, and that is so hard to wrap our heads around. I know some were like, some were hearing me say that human, human civilization goes back 250,000 years and they're laughing. And here I am saying that some beings may be millions of years old. But I think we really got to get past this doctrine of, oh, human beings lived to 100, 125, whatever, somewhere around there. That's it, right? But we, we know there are other animals on the planet that live, that live longer than that. For one, we know that there are other species that live longer and there are and there are things like trees that live far longer there are trees that live thousands of years okay so we got we can't limit ourselves to just what the human experience is for explaining all of this so when these beings came here there was what what the anuma ilish talks about is that there was this perfect harmony here perfect everything was exactly balanced nothing was out of place and when they came here, they completely disrupted everything. They tried to play God. They, they manipulated and tampered with a lot of the different things here because they wanted to just create their own world. And that's what they did. And they wanted to create a physical worker to rule in this, on this, in this world for them so that they wouldn't have to to be part of it. They could be like these overlords basically. And because the Ajiji didn't want to do that anymore. And I'm going to read you a, uh, I'm going to read you a translation from the Adrahasis that talks exactly about that. Okay. And so what did they wanted to do? They wanted to, they wanted to create a being that was able to be part of this incarnation cycle and to take the place of them and that they could control over and use for their energy. Okay. And so, um, one of the telltale pieces of evidence behind that is when you look at apes, we're told that we came straight from apes. We're just advanced apes, right? Except for the fact that most people don't know this. It's, it's amazing that apes, most ape primates in the world have 48 chromosomes. Chromosomes represent these groups of DNA that are clumped together. In uh, human beings have 46. We're missing two chromosomes, right? How, and if you think about what that means, how could we be missing two chromosomes? It means that two were fused together. It means that they were fused together and that's, that's how we became what we are. And that is impossible to occur in nature. We're talking about something that's so advanced, it's beyond anything that the natural world could create because it's way too sophisticated. It's something that is on a level of tampering. It's essentially, it's genetic tampering, okay? At the same time, we have this, gen this DNA inside of us that's not shared by any other species on the planet that they call non-coded coded DNA or junk DNA. So there's these telltale signs that automatically tell us we're not like the animal kingdom. We're separate from the animal kingdom and we're something that's been created here um, based on artificial means that came from something natural, okay? And I think a lot of people, when they hear that and they, and they see the evidence, they, they say, I knew it all along. 
I knew that there was, that we were, you know, love in the way that our consciousness and the way we perceive the universe is, it can't just be some larger brain that creates it. There's something else going on there. Okay. Now the evidence to prove that so that people can, can look at that is in 1849 in Nineveh, Iraq, they found this, this library called the Ashurbanipal library, probably the most important library in history that at least we found. There's another, there's another library called the Hall of Records that's supposedly below Giza, Egypt, that still hasn't been found or it's been hidden that we haven't, hasn't been disclosed. But for now, the, the library of Ashurbanipal contains um, some of the most important tablets ever written, such as the Atrahasis and Enuma Elish, which I brought up before. And so um, tablet one of the Atrahasis states, and it, it's basically the origin story of mankind, okay? And what it states is, and remember these terms that, that, I, that I read from other tablets, like the Sumerian King List and Eridu Genesis. Remember all that what I said, because you're going to see it's the same thing that comes across in, in yet another tablet. It says, when the gods instead of man did the work for the loads, the gods' load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. They took and cast the lots. The gods made the division. The Anunnaki of the sky made the Ajiji bear the workload. The Ajiji gods had to dig out the canals, had to clear the channels, the lifelines of the land. For 3,600 years, they bore the excess. That is essentially talking about these irrigation canals in Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates River. And then if you don't clear them out, they, they fill up with sand and silt and they literally cease to be rivers. You can't even use them. So if, if agriculture is one of the most important things, for a being that is physical to survive on, agriculture is like key, then that would be one of, the, one of the most important things they would have to do. And that's exactly what they were doing. So these GG beings were doing all of this work here, having to dig these channels to create these massive farms and all these different things. They were the ones doing the work. And so what happened? Well, they revolted. They refused to do the work anymore. They, they charged up to this being known as Enlil's domain in Akur. And they, they demanded relief from, from doing that in this world. They, they had done it for 3,600 years. And they, and they didn't want to do it anymore. They, they, they were above that type of mentality. So, so Enlil hears all of this. And he says, he, he sent for Anu to be brought down. He says, Enlil sent for Anu to be brought down to him. Enki was fetched into his presence. Anu, king of the sky, was present. Enki, king of the Absu, was present. All the great Anunnaki were present. Ea, who was another name for Enki, made his voice heard and spoke. Let us create a mortal man so that he may bear the yoke, the work of Enlil. Let man bear the load of the gods. Nintu made her voice heard and spoke. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth of the month, I shall make a purification by washing. Then one god shall be slaughtered. Then a god and a man will be mixed together in clay. Let a ghost come into existence from the God's flesh and let the ghost exist as to not forget the slain God. So they took one of these Ajiji and they, they killed him. They took his blood and then they took a Neanderthal and a Denisovian and they created through much trial and er error to create this mortal man so that we could do the work of the Ajiji and which was originally done by the gods, remember these that that i had spoken about that they no longer wanted to have this chain of reality in the third dimension they wanted to, to go to go above it and that's what they did they, they went through this process of creating us so that we could essentially take on the load that they didn't want to take on okay which is basically existing in an incarnation cycle in the third dimension over and over and over again until you can eventually ascend and, and go beyond the physical dimension and that can take countless lifetimes especially if you create a reality that's based on war and the deception of information, then you could essentially trap those conscious mortal human beings forever. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. And, and so at the same time, we're going to return to the Eridu Genesis where it also says, remember this correlation back and forth over and over again. It says when on Enlil, Enki and Ninhar saga fashioned the dark headed people, Okay, that's what it says. And what is dark-headed people? It has, has nothing to do with skin color. Dark-headed, just like we see these eagle-headed and all these different headed people, these, these murals around the world, it represents their mentality. 
dark headed would be just ignorant, having no information at all. So they fashioned mankind that were essentially completely ignorant of everything. And that's where you get into like the whole Adam and Eve story and all this different stuff about how mankind was taught certain things. And there was all this conflict about, Oh, were we giving too much information or are we giving not enough? And that's where it comes down to this. It became this conflict in the higher dimensions over how, what the purpose was behind mankind. Are we just workers here or are we made for something greater? And that's what this conflict of as above, so below became where the conflict in the higher dimensions manifested down and became this turmoil in our reality. Okay. And, and I want to just read one more thing, Chris, that again, is just, it's one more piece to connect to this. When, when you look at an, yet another tablet, you look at the, um, the Enuma Elish on tablet six, it states, and notice how similar this is to all the other things I read. It states, they bound him, holding him before Ea, they inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Ea had created mankind on, and imposed the service of the gods upon them, it, it says it again just to like really show that. The task is beyond comprehension. The gods were then divided, all the Anunnaki into upper and lower groups. He assigned 300 in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu and appointed them as guard. So here you go, yet again, upper and lower groups, higher and lower dimensions. Remember, it mentioned how it said in, in the Atrahasis, it said, it said, Anu, king of the sky, was present. Enki, king of the Apsu, attended. The Apsu is the lower realms, the lower dimensions where Enki was forced to reside. That's why it says that they were divided into upper lower groups. These beings that conquered reality literally learned, literally took over every aspect of our reality from the lower dimensions and the upper dimensions so that the third dimension is sandwiched right in between and they can control every aspect of it. That's, that was what they did. And, and it's not like all that there's all this, these um, malevolent, ideas like oh we're just gonna trap them and we're gonna you know use them as slaves there's it's it's much more complicated than that they're they're all, these beings were quite divided over how they wanted mankind to go and so it's not just one side or another they were actually constantly fighting over over how we should end up and how our story should go and that's why it's really interesting when you when you read the Andre Hesus and let's talk be in a whole nother show Chris but you read about these disasters you, you learned that they actually created the disaster so that they could wipe out every, the, um, the place that mankind had, had gotten to, these civilizations, because they had gotten out of control. And they wanted to reset everything and start over again. And that's exactly what they did. And that's why the legend of Atania states that after the floods came through, Atania was chosen to be the architect of the new world in Kish. He was the first one. And that's where that came from. Okay? So... What are we? We're, we're, the, we're the children of the gods. We, we are in many ways gods ourselves because one of the things you read about is that Enki was supposed to just create us to be like a primitive worker to do the job that needed to be done here, but he ended up making us, in, with the help of others, making us into this incredible being who has the ability to reach such high states of consciousness that we would have the ability to break out of this cycle and become, we, we could literally someday, and I think some, some beings have already done this. If you look throughout history, we could conquer our reality as well and become our own creator gods and take over this realm instead of having it be created for us. Because when you look all around the world, how our reality has been dominated by war for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it's, it, every time it's just another war created. And then you see these quotes from some of these secret society families like the Rothschilds where they talk about how if, if they didn't want war, there would be no war at all. It's, it's just so mind-blowing and dark to consider that, that our reality would be controlled in a certain way to prevent people from reaching higher states and to, be, to remain in a lower state. But I really think that that's what happened. So to, to end out on, on, on this, Chris, human beings are um, we're incredible, we're, we're far more special than we've been told in school. And each individual has the opportunity to reach higher states of consciousness and 
um, live whatever life they want to, but we're, we're so controlled with all these different mechanisms and means that we often are so blinded by that, that we'll go lifetime, lifetime after lifetime without ever even realizing you know, what we are and what our consciousness is. And then, so that's why right now, you and I talking right now, having the, the, the ability to have technology to discuss all these things, this is a very special time period. And I don't think people should take it for granted. This is when we have the opportunity to regain all that we've lost and to get back to, to what we once were, um, which I think would be a great transition after Chris to, I guess, talk about what were what happened back then right what 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 occurred what are, your, what are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on um what defines us I, I believe that this is just a meat suit that we're in that we are consciousness and our consciousness is so much more than we could ever imagine and it's part of everything um you know i i think that we have so much untapped potential that that we could you know take over our own destiny again become something greater that something that we were meant yeah. to be all along if we just you know focused each and every one of us on our own potential wonderfully said i i completely agree and that's that's exactly right that's the whole purpose it's a it's about it's about our collective it's not about the individual it's not about competing it's about everyone coming together that realize that we're all just people on this planet and that we can progress to the next level if we all work together instead of these so silly distractions that, that, that come between us. So what are we regaining, right? What, what did we lose? What are we trying to get back? And, and what that is, is like I was saying early in the show, it's a complete lost chapter of human history. You could even say chapters in some cases, I think. And what you're looking on the screen are two locations from completely different corners of the world. Um, the image on the left, excuse me, the image on the left is uh, Baalbek, Lebanon, and then bottom right is also Baalbek. And then the top right is from Peru, okay, outside of Cusco. The point I want to make with that is when I talked about how there are these megalithic civilizations that had this advanced knowledge, you, you said to yourself, well, what were they doing trying to make all this stuff? What was the purpose of all this stuff, right? Why would they spend this much time to create these structures, right? Are they just putting rocks together? Who cares? It was so much more about that. In many ways, these, these civilizations that were alive back then were more sophisticated and advanced than we were. Not on a technological standpoint with cars and computers, but on an, an understanding of the nature of reality itself, on energy, on consciousness on the universe, on constellations, on um, the procession of the equinoxes, everything. They, they understood that far more than we ever could right now. We're, we're just getting back to that right now. So what you're seeing right now are these structures that they created all around the world to harness what is called electromagnetic energy. When we think of you know, that story of, with Newton, right, of the apple falling from the tree, um, oh, that's what, that's what creates gravity. Well, what is gravity? Gravity is a byproduct of electromagnetic energy. It's, it's created through the mass of an object. That's it. So what it really comes down to, and some have called it um, an electric universe, and in some aspects it is, everything is just based on electromagnetism and, and the connection between energy. That's, that's it. It's, it's this vibrational energy that makes up everything in the universe. And that's why they became so obsessed with energy and harnessing higher states of energy, okay? So I want to give you a couple of little tidbits because people love these. On the left, what you're seeing is Baalbek, Lebanon, okay? So that's in the Mediterranean region, region just on the northwest side of, um, of this Mesopotamian area. And you're looking at this, uh, the ancient city called Heliopolis, okay? And this is known as the Temple of Jupiter. Now. Those blocks on the left, the biggest one is called the Trilithon block, okay? And it weighs more than 1,000 tons. To give people some perspective, one ton equals 2,000 pounds. You do the math. These, these blocks were so massive that we could not move them today. I know some people have thought we can with cranes and all this different stuff, 
But I'm telling you, the, sophisticated, the, the sophistication that went into these structures is even beyond our capability today, or at the least at the very upper end of it. And at the, it's not like we're creating these structures today, you know? So, um, and, and what's really interesting about these massive blocks is, first of all, how do they move them? They're proof in themselves that our, our history is far more advanced than we've been told. Because we're told that human civilizations arose 4,500 years ago from, Egypt, um, from Mesopotamia, and then they spread across, and they were using pulleys and all these different silly means for doing this, and people just accept them. Meanwhile, in the Great Pyramid of Giza, um, in the center of the Great Pyramid, in the Osiris, Osiris temp, um, chamber, you have these granite blocks that are, that are put in place there that are more than 50 tons. They are elevated to such a degree that it would have been completely impossible. You would, you would have had to have a ramp that's as big as the pyramid itself to be able to put those into place. So it really brings up questions about how they did it, first of all, which I can... I can express my opinion on that. And also, it shows you just how advanced they were to understand this. Because first of all, I don't think this is based on, you know, manpower, lifting things in a place based on manpower. I think it has nothing to do with that. I think it has to do with advanced telekinesis technology and sound frequency technology, using harmonic frequencies to move things based on, based on things that we're just discovering now today. Okay? Now... What's interesting about these blocks in the, all these temples, and you see this everywhere around the world, in, in every case, these megalithic temples, they're either temples or they're pyramids and shrines. That, that's what they all are. They're all, they're all essentially the same thing. And what they're doing is, is harnessing this electromagnetic energy. So they were all built right on these specific convergence zones known as ley lines around the world. So if you plot every single megalithic ancient structure around the world, you'll see that it falls on each one of these specific spots, okay? And they weren't just taking rocks from the area. Oh, look at this. There's, a, there's, a quarry, there's an area we can quarry rocks here. Let's build it right here. No, in fact, that's what made it even more challenging. Some of these locations were nowhere near rocks. So they had to sometimes haul some of these rocks that they were going to use for these structures hundreds, if not thousands of miles and I think that, again, that's some people are going to roll their eyes when they hear that, but let me explain. What they were using is a very, very specific type of rock. They wanted a granitic, quartz-rich rock that would not only last for great periods of time and not, and not erode, that was very hard, but it had this high, rich quartz content, which is about energy. It's about this higher vibrational energy they contain. So if you build a structure with those types of, of, of rocks, you can create a massive harmonic structure that vibrates at a certain vibrational frequency. And today, if you go into the Great Pyramid of Giza, they've found that there are chambers in there that are literally mapped towards the harmonic frequency of higher consciousness. So it's, there's, there's overwhelming evidence that's really supporting it. But, and this is where it gets really interesting. So some of these stones, and I want to throw this out there, in Egypt, some of these granite blocks they had to use to build most of these places were from the Aswan Quarry, which is hundreds and hundreds of miles away. How did they move them there? How did they get them there? And it shows you how specific they were. They needed certain kinds of rocks from certain locations. And at the, at, located at that Aswan Quarry, you find the unfinished obelisk, which is the largest obelisk in the world. And I think the obelisk, in conjunction with these structures, was, were like, like an antenna. You know, like if you have, like today where we see um, some wireless antenna or something, I think that those obelisk structures were acting in conjunction with these large megalithic temples and pyramids to basically harness energy and create these higher states of consciousness. Now, in, in Karnak, Egypt, there are these huge blocks in, some of the, in, 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 in the temple there that are over, over 50 tons. And they're made of this, of this type of material, this type of rock called travertine. Okay, now travertine is only found in Turkey over a thousand miles away. They literally had to move and take those specific types of rocks and, and go all the way down to that location just to build these temples because that's the type of harmonic frequency they wanted using that because travertine is a special type of rock just like these granitic rocks okay and that's so mind-blowing because it really gives us an understanding of why they did this 
right? What was the purpose behind all these? Um, and I, I want to just throw out a few more facts. I know it's really late, Chris, so we need to wrap up here after this. Um, sure. So um, if you look at, if we're in Egypt right now, right? We're, in this, we're at the Sphinx. Look at how small the head is compared to the body. Now, what, um, what archaeologists have now discovered and are really looking at, like, like Robert Schock and others, who are brilliant, is that the head is way too small for the body. It shows you that it was, it was, it was recarved. And what it used to look like was a lion. And how do we know that? If you, if you look at what's known as the precession of the equinoxes, when you look at these, um, at what, what these ancient cultures were all obsessed with, it was energy, consciousness, and these different positions with the, with the processional equinoxes. They were known as the different zodiac ages. And they knew that based on where these different locations were pointed, it would have a certain kind of energy. Because these star constellations have, everything is energy. And that's all, that's what it all, all comes down to. And so when you look at the dating of the Sphinx and you look at the Sphinx enclosure and how there's water erosion marks all around the outside and, there, and, and uh, ice core data and um, historical rainfall patterns prove that there wasn't any heavy rain in that area anywhere near that time period we're told it was built. You go back and you say, well, when was it raining hard enough to create that? And you find out that it was more than 10,000 years ago, probably roughly around 12,000 years ago. At the same time, when you look at where this, the, 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 uh, the Sphinx is facing, you saw that, okay, so 12,000 years ago, it was facing the constellation of Leo. And hey, it was carved like a lion. Doesn't that make sense, right? And that's exactly what happened. Now, so what is, what is the procession of the equinoxes? Some people might not understand and how the zodiac is, 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 um, is understood. Our Earth... Is, is, is rotating around all, all the time, right? It's constantly in this rotation around the sun, but it's also wobbling. It's slightly wobbling um, based on its axis. And that axis wobble is what's known as precession. So basically it means that as our planet spins and turns around, that wobble means that it faces a different constellation every certain amount of years. It's, it's like just a little over 2000 years or so. Because the entire cycle of it going all the way around and, 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 and turning and seeing every constellation, the 12 different zodiacs, is a 25,700 year period. So that's the great cycle that exists here. It's this 25,000 year cycle where the Earth is wobbling and facing a different constellation every certain amount of years, right? And so that's known as the zodiac ages. That's why these cultures were so obsessed with the zodiac. And they created all of these different pyramidal structures and these megalithic structures around different zodiacal time periods facing different constellations. So when you go to the Great Pyramid of Giza and you look at these air shafts, like the King and Queen's Chamber, you see that the King's Chamber is facing the Orion. You know, they're supposed to be like this gateway to um, ascension of consciousness. And then you look at the Queen's Chamber is facing Sirius. And you say, you say but wait a minute, but it's not facing that today. Well, when was it facing that? And you look back and you use computer programs to say you jaunt back further and further and further back and you get the same age right about between um, 12,000 years ago and, and, and over 10,500 years ago. So this same lost time period where the pyramids were all created, the Sphinx was created, all these megalithic structures were all created around the world, Gobekli Tepe, all these things were all created around the 12,000 year period to 12,800 year period, somewhere in that time period, they were all created. And then there were all those civilizations were destroyed. And then we're just left with all these remnants that, that exist now. Um, and so today, today we we're in a, we're in a world where we're being dumbed down by our consciousness. The truth is completely suppressed and hidden. We think that we're just a primitive ape and all of this stuff exists, but most people are just not even aware of it, or they're going to ignore it because it's, how are they going to look if they're trying to talk to other people? All these things come down to a, this lost history that we're trying to regain back now. And the evidence from Mesopotamian tablets and ancient Gnostic texts and these, these, these structures all around the world, they really show us that our human, human civilizations go back far further than we've been told, and they're much more sophisticated than we've been told too. 
Very well said. I mean, I agree 100%. And there's so much that we could tap into just by learning more about ourselves. And Matt, that was fantastic information. I know we ran out of time there. So, you know, you're going to have to come back on again, of course. I know. I, I, I keep thinking to myself, let's say I was like, man, I hope I don't, you know, run out of information before it's too late. But now I think to myself, we didn't even, we could have talked about so much more that we didn't even really get into that I wanted to. Um, but Chris, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. And I, I apologize for not letting you talk more. I tend to get, get on this. this no, I always whole, learn something. It's, it's fantastic. so hard to stop. Yeah. I always learn um, something. It's great. Thanks, my friend. Um, for, for people who are interested, uh, please check out. Um, Chris has got a fantastic YouTube website called Forbidden Knowledge News. He does a great job talking not only about ancient history, but about all the current stuff that's going on in the world right now. Um, and I have um, my YouTube channel is at Matthew LaCroix, where I put up a lot of videos, um, talks like this. And I have an, a new author website I really want people to visit because I have a lot of these translations right in, on the website themselves where you can go read them as well as I'm including information and those, those translations and many, 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 many more in this, in this, the new book called The Stage of Time, which I'm hoping to release either next month or by July. I'm just at the end of it right now, but I'm very, I'm very excited for that. Um, it's the culmination of, of everything that I've studied and put together up to this point. But, um, but thanks so much for, for a great discussion, Chris. I hope we can do it again soon. Definitely, and we will definitely be looking forward to that book. And Matt, you have a great rest of your day there. Thanks, my friend. Talk to you soon.